students to this lecture. And typically we have two, four, six. Last week we had around eight students out of 35 watching the lecture. And then I thought, oh yes, we do have everything on the video, but we had uh, three watches on YouTube last week, three. So maybe 11 students watched the lecture last week. Maybe 35 students will watch the lecture one week before the exam, but that's too late, you all know it. Uh, so especially those who will, especially those who will not watch the video. <laughs> I'll talk to Mr. Falkas, you recommend it, I'll do it. Because I'm interested to have as low a failure rate as possible in the exam. That's what I want to have. Okay, yeah. And uh, yes, let me tell you that I made some minor adjustments of the slides this morning while preparing the lecture. So the slides, uh, uh, no, the script you got last week, there are some minor modifications to make, but you will see it when you watch the slides here. Oh, and uh, we have to switch on the beamer. Okay, yeah, but let me, t let me start on the blackboard. So what we, what did we do last week? Yes, we talked about uh, about estimating the parameters of a normal distribution given some data points. And we talked about marginal and conditional Gaussian distributions. And what we do now is we will talk about Gaussian distributions again. Given a set of data points, we are looking for a normal distribution that fits these data points best. And now here we have four different normal distributions. I mean, here we have three of them. They all have the same standard deviation, but a different mean. And probably this one would fit these data better than this one or that one. But now we can ask the question, is this better or this? I mean, here we have a more narrow standard deviation. Yeah, and now let me, let me uh, take a different start again. Suppose we are given one data point, just one point, and we are looking for a Gaussian distribution um, for the moment with a fixed standard deviation. So standard deviation is given, but we are just looking for a normal distribution with this fixed standard deviation sigma. So sigma is fixed. And now which one would be the best normal distribution? Is it this one? Or is it this one? Or is it this? So look, the picture here is, what we do is, we, we shift our normal distribution over the whole real axis. And we ask, which one of these is the best? I mean, of course, this question is not well defined. Which one is the best? What does it mean to be the best? Huh? Now, the, let's call this point X. And now we, we, we ask the question, uh, or we look at the probability for observing this point X given the mean mu of our distribution. 
I mean, I already told you sigma is fixed. So the only open parameter is the mean of our normal distribution mu. And now what we do is we are looking for the maximum of this function. Um, yeah. So we are looking for the maximum of this function p and the, now our view at the moment is typically we look at this function as a function of x. Yeah? So this is, look at this normal distribution, it is a function of x. But now we have to change our viewpoint. We look at this as a function of mu because we are, we are, we want to determine this parameter mu. And that's now what we, we, we now will call this the likelihood function. Um, and this, uh, sorry, no, it's, excuse me. <laughs> Lx of mu. The likelihood function now depends on our parameter mu. Okay, this is the whole game for one data point given. Now suppose there is a second data point given. Now when we have a second data point, now we assume that these data points are drawn independently from the same distribution. So the two data points, we already defined this, they are IID. Independently, identically distributed from the same distribution but drawn independently. And now, if this is the case, then we can, uh, yeah, we can write the probability for observing P of, for observing X1. Now, this is X1 and this is X2. And X2 given mu, we can write this as the product of P of x1 given mu times P of x2 given mu. Yeah? And of course this is only true if these two data points um, are drawn independently. Yeah? If they are independent then we can split this density up into the product. And now if we have more than two points, then still I can split up the joint uh, density into a product of the individual densities. And that's what we now do. Now, yeah, look, we have given a set of data points x1 through xn now. Yeah? And we will call this set x. And we are looking for a normal distribution that maximizes the likelihood for observing these points. So the likelihood function Lx depending on mu and sigma now is nothing but our conditional probability for observing x given mu and sigma squared. And this joint density function for all these variables splits up into the product um, of all these uh, conditional probabilities for observing every single data point. Okay, and now these uh, conditional probabilities 
because we are looking for normal uh, distributions, are given by this formula. So here we have these parameters mu, the mean, and uh, sigma squared, the variance. Okay, um, and now, I mean, we are looking for values of mu and sigma that um, maximize the likelihood for observing the data points. Huh? Okay, and now, before we maximize this function, we apply the logarithm to it. I mean, we can do this, but we don't have to. We could directly maximize this function, but it's easier to apply the log to it before, because then we would uh, lose the exponential function and everything is much simpler. Huh? And you know it's allowed to apply the logarithm for ma before maximizing a function. Why is this no problem? We cannot apply any function and then maximize. But with the logarithm, it's no problem. Why? Hmm? Yeah, because it's strictly monotonic. Yeah? So we can apply any uh, strictly monotonic function, but here the logarithm is uh, the best choice. Okay. So that's why we look at the log likelihood function, which we get here. Huh? You see the, the uh, exponential function here vanishes and the product trans transforms into a sum because the log of a product is the sum of the logarithms. Okay, and you see everything is much easier now because uh, we just... Uh, uh, the exponential function just vanishes. Okay, and now um, we will maximize this log likelihood function with respect to the mean mu. Yeah? And the solution is this. I mean, here of course I skipped a few steps like uh, calculating the, um, the gradient and so on. And this is the result. And this is nothing surprising, it's just the mean of our data points. Okay, yeah, and next of course we will uh, maximize the log likelihood with respect to um, the variance and we get this result. Yeah, and this is, maybe this is a little bit surprising because what we get is not the sample variance. Huh? In the sample variance, here we would have 1 over n minus 1. Huh? And I mean, it's one of the exercises to prove that with the 1 over n minus 1, the sample variance is unbiased. But this is not the sample variance and therefore it's a biased estimator uh, for the variance. I mean, we will later see when we compare this method to Bayesian inference the differences. Um, I mean, but for the moment this is not too bad a result. Yeah. Okay, yeah, and now let's um, look at this treatment a little bit more formally. So what we did is we, we maximized the likelihood function. Huh? And the likelihood function is a function from the parameter space, we call it gamma here, to uh, the, the real numbers. So we are looking for a particular value of our parameter. Yeah? And the likelihood function, I mean here we view our probability density function as a function of the parameter. Yeah? So this 
conditional probability for x given a, a parameter, so we just, uh, I mean, we change the viewpoint. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I mean, that's the point. The likelihood function is a far function of the parameters, whereas the joint density is a function of x. Okay, and the next step was maximizing uh, the likelihood. Yeah? So, um, what we have is the maximum likelihood estimator, if we call this t, it is a mapping from the, uh, the space of our data vectors to uh, the parameter space. Yeah. Of course, I mean, if we have different data points, we will get probably a different um, parameter. And what happens basically is we are looking for the supremum um, over the parameters of the likelihood function. Uh -huh. I mean, the supremum, why don't we write maximum here? I mean, this, this is a, a slight formal difference. The supremum is the, the least upper bound, the, the lowest, smallest upper bound, which is in, uh, for finite sets, it's equal to the maximum. Yeah? Okay. And uh, of course, what we can also do and leads to the same result is maximum, maximize the log likelihood. Okay, yeah, let's look at another example. So what we did now is we determined the parameters of a normal distribution. Now we look at a different distribution, which is actually well known to us, but we haven't seen it um, under this name. It's the Bernoulli distribution. Um, and it's quite a simple distribution. We have a, a binary variable with values 1 and 0. Um, and the probability for this variable to be a 1 uh, is a fixed, uh, a fixed number. Uh, we call it mu here. And the probability for x equals 0 is 1 minus mu. So it's just a binary random variable. And of course, that's what we had when we talked about random number generators. Huh? because we talked about the random bit generators and what we have here is a random bit with a probability of mu for being one. Uh, I mean, uh, this mu here is, uh, has, it has not much to do with the mean we have seen before. This mu is the probability for our random variable to be one. That's it. Yeah? That's what we, in the random numbers chapters, uh, we, we, I guess it was p. Yeah? But here, because we are talking about, we call the density function p, it wouldn't be nice to have a p for this probability. So we take now mu for this. Okay, and I mean, this is the easiest way to see how this uh, Bernoulli distribution is defined. Um, Another way to write it is like that. Yeah? Um, but remember, this x um, only has the two values 0 and 1. Yeah? So for x equal 1, we get mu. For x equal 0, we get 1 minus mu, what we have here. And what's also quite easy to show is the expected value of the Bernoulli distribution is mu and the variance is mu times 1 minus mu. Uh, um, and actually, you have shown this in the exercises. Maybe, yes, you have shown this for mu equal 1 half. Uh, okay, and now we want to determine this parameter mu of the Bernoulli distribution 
um, with the maximum likelihood estimator for a given set of data points. Okay, yeah. Um, now again we do have some data points xj independently uh, chosen uh, according to a Bernoulli distribution with um, parameter mu. Yeah. And now the joint probability distribution is this here. I mean here we already uh, did one step of calculation. The joint probability distribution is the product over all the probab single probabilities. Yeah? Um, but I mean we have, yeah maybe we should look at this on the board. So we have P of X given mu and this is the product um, J equal 1 to how many points n? Yeah. Um, P of X J given mu um, yeah. And this is mu to the power xj times 1 minus mu uh, to the power, um, what is it, 1 minus xj. Yeah. And now we have uh, the product of such an exponential function, which is, uh, I mean, we can just pull this product into the exponent, mu to the power sum over j xj times 1 minus mu to the power sum over j 1 minus xj. And what we have here is exactly this. Huh? With the slight difference that here we have an n but the sum over 1 n times is n. Okay, so this is the joint probability. And now again we take the log likelihood and uh, the derivative with respect to the parameter and we get this. And now if we set this equal uh, 0, so solving this equation leads to this formula for mu and you see this again is the sample mean. Okay, yeah, um, I mean are there any questions about this uh, maximum likelihood method? I mean now it's, it's important that you really understood the principle. Okay, fine. Now we will apply the maximum likelihood method to our function approximation task you remember from last semester. I mean last semester we did quite a bit of function approximation and basically a, a really nice method um, we, uh, yeah, we, we used what uh, is the least squares method. Yeah? The least squares method which basically is equivalent to the pseudo inverse method. Yeah? Given our data points, given the data points and a class of functions, maybe polynomials, maybe trigonometric functions, whatever. Given the data points and a class of functions, we are looking for a set of parameters, for a set of parameters that minimize the, uh, the sum of squared errors. That's what we did last semester. I hope you all remember. And now we want to solve the same task given a set of data points like here. First and a set of basis functions. 
Here you can see, oh yeah, actually suppose these basis functions are here sine and cosine. And we want to fit such a trigonometric function to these data points. That's the task. And last semester we did this by minimizing the sum of squared arrows. I mean the picture was then the following. Um, yeah. So we, the sum of squared arrows is the sum of the length of all these bars. Over the, over the whole interval. The sum of the squares of all the lengths of these vertical arrow bars. That's what we minimized. And the solution finally was the pseudo-inverse method. Huh? We just have to calculate the pseudo-inverse um, of the matrix we get when we write down uh, our, uh, the, the ansatz for this method. Yeah. And now we take a different view. Now we assume we assume that these points, they come from some underlying function. And for the moment we assume that the, uh, the underlying set of basis functions are the sine and the cosine. And that on top of these, this function, there is some Gaussian noise. That's the assumption. We assume that the deviations from the function we are actually looking for, of course at the moment we don't know this blue line. We don't know the function. Huh? But we assume the points come from such a function with some added Gaussian noise. Look, our yi which are the vertical values, come from such a, a vector of parameters times a vector of basis functions. So this is nothing but a linear combination of our basis functions plus some added Gaussian noise. And this epsilon i, yeah, it's a Gaussian noise with zero, zero mean um, and an unknown standard deviation. Yeah. I mean, of course, it's, here it's plausible to assume we have zero mean. This assumption zero mean basically means that a deviation uh, in the negative direction and in the positive di uh, direction on average is the same. Uh? If we would have a systematic shift, then of course, or we would know there is some systematic shift, then we could enter such a non-zero uh, mean here. But for, for in most cases, we don't know anything about systematic shifts. And if we don't know anything, uh, then we assume mu equals zero. Okay, yeah. Yeah, and now we uh, go towards a maximum likelihood treatment of this problem. We can write the probability for such a deviation epsilon i um, as, uh, I mean, it's, it's the density, it's an, uh, the density of a normal distribution with this sigma, yeah. And, and, zero, and zero mean. That's what we see here. If, if mu wouldn't be zero, then we, here we would have epsilon i minus mu. Uh, and now this epsilon i, remember, look, this epsilon i, if this is one data point, then you see epsilon i is the deviation of my current value yi from the correct value of the function. 
And that's why we can write our epsilon i in this form. Epsilon i is equal to yi minus the linear combination of our basis functions. Yeah. Okay, and of course our goal is, again, like it was all the time last semester, our goal is to determine this vector of coefficients or of parameters. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, and now, look, I mean, this is the, the, uh, the density for one data point. And now the probability for observing many independently chosen data points is again just the product of all these uh, individual densities. Huh? And here of course, I mean, here we have uh, yj and xj because we have two dimensional data points. Yeah. Um, and then I mean, now we just apply the maximum likelihood procedure. So we, we take the log of the uh, joint likelihood function, uh, which we get here. I mean, I, again, I don't go into the details of calculating the derivative, but you see the product um, goes into the exponent, and then the exponent vanishes because we take the logarithm. Yeah. And now we have to maximize this function and maybe we should have now a, cl a closer look onto the function we are going to maximize. We will maximize this function with respect to what? I mean, whenever you're looking for a maximum, this is the first question. <coughs> With respect to what? Sigma. No. No, not sigma. What? Why? No, not why. No, not why. Why the y i are the given data points. I mean, we cannot vary the data points. Yeah? And we also can't vary sigma, because sigma is given. Yeah? A. A. A, that's what we are looking for. Yeah, that's what we are looking for. Yeah? And uh, typically, the thing you are looking for, that's uh, the, the quantity with respect to which you have to maximize. Yeah? OK. So we want to maximize this function with respect to this vector a. Yeah? OK, and now um, then we can actually delete these two parts of the function because they don't depend on a. <coughs> so what remains and also, um, yeah, and that's quite nice, we can also delete this here. We cannot delete the minus sign but we can delete these because they don't depend on A. So basically what we maximize is, so maybe we do it like that, we maximize minus this sum. So that's what we maximize. And now, I mean, if your memory of last semester would still be perfect, then you would immediately recognize something. If you look at this, what is this? What is this sum? The sum is well known to you. The least squares? Yeah. It's not the least, it's the sum of squared errors. Huh? But that's exactly what we had last semester. That's the sum of squared errors. And that's nice. So, I mean, we could now, we could stop now. Because we know how to solve this, you know everything. So what we have shown now is that the maximum likelihood uh, method gives us the same solution as least squares. 
and the solution is um, the pseudo inverse. Huh? Okay, I mean that's what mentioned here. Huh? Maximizing the log likelihood with respect to a, oh this should be a vector a, so it should be bold phase. Uh, with respect to a is the same as minimizing the sum of squared errors. And the, the maximum likelihood solution is the same as the least square solution. Okay. I mean, now on, on this and the next slide, we actually do the same work again. So, we take the gradient with respect to uh, A um, of the log likelihood function um, and that's what we get. So, maybe we should go back here. So, that's the function we, let's look. So, without the minus, we minimize the function. With the minus up here, we would maximize it. Yeah? So, if you take the gradient of this function with respect to A, then the 2 here would vanish, but we, we would get the inner derivative which gives us a factor of, X, of F behind here. So, that's what we get. Yeah. Oh, actually, why do we have the 1 over sigma square here? Yeah, because we actually take the derivative of this and not of that. But it doesn't matter because it's only a constant factor. Okay, now we set this to zero. Uh, then we get this here. Um, and um, yeah, we can now here draw this vector A out of the, this uh, product and write it like that. And now, now we see that we have the same solution um, as we had with the pseudo-inverse method. So we have this matrix F transpose and here we have F transpose F times A. Um, yeah, remember that this uh, function f here is a vector. It's a vector valued function. Yeah? And here we have this sum over j, so this gives us the product of this f transpose times f. Um, yeah. And this is exactly the solution, uh, the pseudo inverse solution. So I don't go into the details because, I mean, we spent so much time last semester on this. Um, yeah, yeah, okay, and here you again can see, I mean, this is the definition of this matrix F. Yeah? Um, so this matrix F, um, the, the rows of this matrix F are the transposed vectors of this function F. Yeah? Um, yeah. So one one row in this matrix is the sum of all the basis functions applied to one data point. So to the first data point, then here. Uh, oh, did I say the sum? Sorry, no, of course it's not. I mean, it's the vector. So it's f1 of x1, then f2 of x1, and so on. And here, f1 of x2, f2 of x2, and so on. Okay, oh yes, and uh, um, so what we call f here, uh, that's what we called last semester m, this matrix m. Because last semester, this matrix m was uh, kind of more general. I mean, the pseudo-inverse method, you can apply it even if there is no function approximation problem. Uh, you can apply it whenever. I mean, that's a matter of linear algebra. To what problems in linear algebra can we apply the pseudo-inverse <coughs> method? Over 
system? Overdetermined linear systems, yes. That's it. Yeah? And here we, I mean, typically we have an overdetermined system. What does overdetermined mean here if we look at our data points? I mean, this here really is overdetermined. What does overdetermined mean here? We got more data points than parameters. Yes, yes. I mean, here we have two parameters, A1 and A2 for this trigonometric problem, but I don't know, maybe 50 or 100 data points. Huh? But we can apply the pseudo-inverse method also in case of an underdetermined problem. Yeah? So we could actually uh, here, if we would have uh, three data points and 20 basis functions, we could, uh, we could also try to apply the pseudo-inverse method. I mean, whether this would give us good results is a different question. Yeah? Okay, yeah. So, and we can write the solution, the maximum likelihood solution for our vector in this way. Huh? And, um, yeah, um, so this now, that's the pseudo inverse huh? of our matrix F. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, okay. And now, of course, still there is the question, maybe we want to know our sigma. Yeah? So the, the standard deviation or variance of our data points. But once we found our set of parameters, this is no longer difficult. Yeah? Because now we know the function. Let's go back to the picture. Now we know the function. So we know the blue line and all the points. How would you now determine the, the standard deviation of these points from our blue line? I mean, why don't we just calculate the sample variance? The sample variance, which is nothing but all these black bars we just drew before. Yeah, that's what we do, sorry. Yeah, I mean, what we have here without this 1 over n, this is the sum of squared errors. And now if we then normalize this by n, then we have the, um, the mean squared error. Huh? We have the mean of the squared errors. And that's actually, um, I mean, the, the maximum likelihood solution for our sigma squared. We have seen it before. Huh? Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, let me see. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and now um, we look at some examples. Yeah? We, we can now look at how this method works. We, we look at the results. Yeah? Um, and yeah, let's look at this example. What we did here is um, we take some data points and we fit to these data points a ninth order polynomial. Yeah? And the data points, they were drawn from a, um, from, from a sine function. Sine of 2 pi times x. Um, and if we take 2 pi times x, um, then the, the period of our sign is 1. And you see, here we have the interval from 0 to 1, and we have one full period 
of our sine function. Yeah? And now we take two data points drawn from this sine function with some added Gaussian noise. Um, and the parameter sigma we used is 0.5. Okay, and now if we take these two points and we apply maximum likelihood, then the resulting function, so the resulting ninth order polynomial, is this. That's what we get. I mean, it's not surprising that, that this doesn't look like the sine function because we're only having two data points. And I mean, you shouldn't look at the green uh, function here. Huh? If you just look at these two data points, then the result is not too bad. Okay, now let's take more data points. When we take five points, this is the result. And this already looks quite nice. Now let's increase the number of data points. Here we have two, four, six data points. And that's the result. And this is actually also not surprising. You remember when we did polynomial interpolation last semester? I mean, polynomials can do crazy things like here. Huh? Again, you shouldn't look at our sine function. Yeah? Just look at the data points. And then, I mean, it's a polynomial of degree 9. Maybe that's not what we would uh, expect. I mean, I would have actually been happier if we would have gotten something like that. I mean, this, this red function, that what we get from maximum likelihood, here you see that we have an overfitting effect. Huh? Okay, when we increase the number of points further, that's what we get. Again, it's not so perfect. Again here, a parabola would be better. I mean, of course, if I as the, the, the data engineer would have selected a polynomial of degree 2, then we would have gotten a much better result. Yeah? But, I mean, the point is that in function approximation, quite often, I don't know which fun which, what type of basis functions to use. Um, and then it might happen that a polynomial of degree 2 is not flexible enough. So a higher degree polynomial, of course, is much better because it can fit more complex data first. And second, most of the time my data is not one-dimensional, so I can look at the graph. If it's 17-dimensional, you wouldn't see and could say, oh, let's take a quadratic polynomial. Yeah? So in, in multi-dimensional problems, we want to have very powerful and generic sets of basis functions and a method which does not overfitting like we have it here. Okay, when we further increase the number of points, then we get this. And yeah, and here, how many points do we have? Twenty-four, yeah. Twenty-four points. Now it becomes a little bit better. Huh? And if we would have 100 points, I guess it would be even better. Huh? I mean, here you now you see the trade-off. 
as soon as the number of data points is much larger than um, the degree of our polynomial, then um, we don't have the overfitting effect anymore. Uh, or let's say it's not so, not so strong anymore. Yeah, but what you see and what I wanted to show you with these uh, examples is that there is the danger of overfitting with the maximum likelihood method. Huh? And that's why we will now look at a different method. Um, yeah, what we do now is Bayesian inference. Um, yeah, and Bayesian inference um, is quite similar. It's quite similar. And maybe now we should uh, yeah, talk a little bit about um, conditional probabilities. So here we called our data points x. Yeah? Um, and for multidimensional problems, we do have the design matrix, capital X. The design matrix contains all our data points. So X is the set of data points. And now, in order to make it really simple, for the moment, we assume that we don't do a regression, so we are not looking for a function, we are just looking for a binary decision. For a bi so we want to solve a binary classification problem. We want to, make, to take a decision. Yeah? Um, so x is our data and now we are looking for a binary decision, a binary variable uh, d a binary decision. Yeah. And um, so what we want is, we want to know the probability for a certain decision given our data x. Yeah? And this d is a class. So d, uh, remember, d is, um, oh, let's say d is in 0, 1. So this variable d can take the, the value 0 or the value 1. Um, yeah. And what we want to know is, for example, probability for d equal 1 given our data x. Yeah. Um, yeah. But what we do have when we, when we make experiments Suppose, uh, let's talk about our appendicitis example. Yeah? So we want to do the appendicitis decision to decide whether a patient has uh, positive appendicitis or negative appendicitis. Yeah? Um, and what, what, what we do is we acquire the symptoms of the patient. These 15 symptoms and that's the vector x. Yeah? So we are given the vector x and we want to know the decision. Okay. And now we want to train our system with such a set of data points. And in our set of data points, you know that these vectors x um, in our data, so we have like the age 28, and then these binary symptoms, then uh, somewhere is the fever and the leukocyte value, 25,000. Um, and then we do have our decision, which is 1 or 0 and so on. Now, 
what we, what we know, what we can easily calculate from our training data here is um, P of x given d equal 1, for example. What we can also easily achieve is P of x given d equal 0, because we just split up our data. We take all the rows with a 1 here, and that's, that's this. And we take all the rows with a 0 here, and now you see we have these conditional probabilities. That's what we know, but we want to have this, and we get this when we apply the base formula. So this is now equal to P of x given d equal 1 times P of d equal 1 divided by P of x. So we need these conditional probabilities we can get from the data and we need to know the priors. We need to know this prior and this prior and then we can calculate this. Okay, yes. So that's what uh, we would do in such a discrete classification case. Um, now we are doing uh, regression. We are doing regression, so it's not so simple just determining such a discrete variable. We are now ta here talking about functions. And knowing such a function means knowing the parameters knowing the parameters for our basis functions. And what we did before, yeah, we have to go back to, um, let's see, no, even further. What, yeah, what we did here is, look, we, we maximized the likelihood function. And the likelihood function was the probability for observing the data given the parameters. And this corresponds to this here. The probability for observing the data given the parameter. That's what we did before in maximum likelihood. But that's actually not what we want. We want to have this guy here. The probability for the parameters, I mean here it's the decision, given the data. And that's what we will now do in Bayesian linear regression. Huh? Um, in Bayesian regression, um, we will use, I mean this is a likelihood function, we will use the likelihood function to determine the posterior probability for the parameters. I mean, again, of course, he here we won't have the discrete variable, we will have the parameters. Okay, yeah. Here, yeah. We want to determine the posterior probability, which is the likelihood times the prior the likelihood times the prior. And, I mean, this here, the denominator, is constant, so it's not important for our maximization. It is constant because it does not deter, uh, depend on, uh, on the parameters. So that's the idea, determining the posterior which is proportional to the likelihood times the prior. Huh? Um, yeah. So first we obtain the likelihood which is P of Y given X and A and then we calculate the posterior which is, look now, the probability for the parameter vector given our data. And I mean the data consist of the X values and the Y value. And this now is equal to, you see here, here we have the likelihood times the prior. 
I mean, this is, this is nothing but applying the base function, uh, the, the base theorem which we have here. Okay, yeah. I mean, this is, this is a likelihood function. It's a product of these uh, normal distributions. So you see, again, we assume that we have Gaussian noise. Um, and yes, uh, and again we assume a zero mean uh, Gaussian prior over, over A with such a parameter alpha. Yeah? Oh, le uh, excuse me, let me see. Um, uh, sorry, I mean this is, this is a different Gaussian. This is the, the we, here we, we assume Gaussian noise. Huh? And I mean, this is, this is the cost for this better method. The cost is that we have to make some assumption over the prior for our parameter. Yeah, let's go back. Here, look, I mean, I, I just uh, suppressed this uh, critical point. We need to know the prior. So we need to know an a priori distribution of our parameters. Yeah? And for simplicity, we assume the parameter has a Gaussian distribution. Um, yeah. A Gaussian distribution with zero mean and um, some variance alpha. Um, yeah, and here you see that we, we don't uh, have just alpha as the parameter, it's alpha times the identity matrix because, I mean, the parameter is a vector and now we are talking about a multidimensional Gaussian. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah, that's, I mean, that's quite interesting because um, so our covariance matrix is diagonal, alpha 1 through alpha k. And the, all the off-diagonal elements are zero. What does this mean um, about our set of parameters? To have such a covariance matrix. I mean, this is an assumption about the parameters. Yeah, we assume the parameters are independent, but this is a, a really a reason, a reasonable assumption because actually we do not want to have parameters which are dependent on each other. Huh? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, so now the posterior distribution um, over A, so P of A given our data and alpha and sigma squared. Um, now is a, is a normal distribution and I mean again I omitted some math here. Uh, uh, what, what did we omit? Look, we omitted calculating this product. Here we have a normal distribution times another normal distribution um, and yeah so we actually have the product of this normal distribution with this product of normal distributions and I mean this is quite a bit of math calculating this multi-product of normal distributions huh? You know how to do this. Last time we looked at multidimensional normal distributions and I showed you a formula for the product of two 
multidimensional normal distributions and it's quite a simple formula. You take the covariance matrices and the formula tells you how to determine the new covariance matrix and by repeatedly applying this math we get this result. So the posterior distribution now again is a normal distribution um, of this parameter alpha given mn and sn and now you see this mn is the new mean yeah? and the new mean is being calculated in this way and the new uh, covariance matrix so the inverse of this covariance matrix is this here yeah. Okay, yeah, and uh, I mean, what we now have to do is um, we, we are looking for, yeah, so the, this posterior distribution, this distribution, we are now looking for the maximum of this distribution um, with respect to uh, the parameter again. Yeah. We take the log of the posterior distribution, of course, again, um, and now take the gradient of this with respect to A, and this leads to this result. Yeah. Um, and now, of course, look at this formula. Look at this here, which is I mean, this is well known. This is the pseudo inverse. This is the pseudo inverse. Um, but we have some added term. Huh? We have this added term lambda times the identity matrix, and this lambda comes from um, sigma squared, which is the variance of our Gaussian noise and uh, this alpha is our uh, the prior about the parameter variance yeah um, yeah and uh, let's see yeah okay and maybe we now also should look at this formula because this is what we maximized yeah? or oh no let's let's change the minus into a plus because then we can minimize yeah? so we we have to minimize this function And look at this term here. This first term is it's the sum of squared errors. That's nothing new. So then, I mean, if this is nothing new, then look at this, because this is what makes the difference. And what is that? I mean, it basically contains our parameter vector. And we can write this maybe in a form which is easier to understand. I mean, this is the vector notation of, of this product, but what is this in component uh, representation? <coughs> so it's 1 over 2 alpha times. Ja, ist es eine Doppelsumme? Einfache Summe, genau. It's actually the sum over i 
AI times AI. Yeah? So you see this is 1 over 2 alpha times sum over I AI square. Yeah. And this can be viewed as now let's for a moment uh, call this parameter lambda. Then what we do here is you can you can view this as a minimization of this function with respect to our parameter vector a <coughs> under the constraint um, a squared. A squared, um, let's see, is equal to equal to zero. Would that it be it? If we do a constraint minimization with this constraint, so with this constraint, sum over a, a i squared equal to zero, um, then this would end up like that in in the Lagrangian function. Yeah. So that's one way to view it. So we we are looking for a minimum of the sum of squared errors under the constraint that the sum over all the, the squares of the parameters is zero. Huh? What does that mean? Um, the sum of the squares of all the parameters to be zero, it's the squares of the parameters, that's important. Huh? Oh, then they would all be zero? Yeah, okay. That would be a trivial solution. Oh yes, um, yeah, it's different. Sorry, because um, this sigma square is a part of this alpha here. So if I mean, if if this this parameter lambda here would be independent of all this here then that, that would be true, yeah. Okay, so let's take a different viewpoint. What we have, what we, what we minimize is this sum. This sum is being minimized. Before, with maximum likelihood, it was only this term. Um, and remember, we got the overfitting problem. And overfitting, what is this with this ninth order uh, polynomial? We have these oscillations. And now we have this added term, which is the sum of the squares of the parameters. So this is part of the function to be minimized. And so now the goal is no longer only to minimize the sum of squared errors, but also to minimize the length of our parameter vector. Because this is nothing but the length of the parameter vector. Look at this. Huh? So we, we minimize at the same time the sum of squared errors and the length of our parameter vector. And uh, getting a shorter parameter vector would mean for our polynomial to have smaller oscillations. Huh? the oscillations will be smaller of such a ninth order polynomial. Because when the parameter values are big, then we have large oscillations. For a parameter value equals zero, 
That's what we have, no oscillations. Huh? No? You don't agree? I don't agree, because it's the sum. You don't have to minimize each of the parts of the sum, but the sum... Yes, but the sum of the squares of a vector is the length of the vector. Yeah, that's, that's true, but uh, that, that line states logarithm of and so on. And it's the sum, it's sum of this and this. Yeah. And therefore, I mean, if we would minimize only this, this would mean um, we would of course get a parameter vector equal to zero. Exactly. Yeah, that's what we don't want. Yes. So we have something in between. I don't tell you the parameter vector has to be zero. Yeah. Huh? yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a combination. Um, before we just minimized the sum of squared errors. And now we add, I mean, that's this term, that's what we call a regularization term. Huh? So we get some damping on the oscillations of our polynomial. I mean, it's still possible that we have oscillations, of course, but they, are, they will be smaller because it's a part of the function to be minimized. The length of our parameter ve vector is part of the function to be minimized. And yeah, maybe we look at the results now. Um, yeah. What we do is, for simplicity again, we take a two-dimensional parameter space such that we can uh, plot it. So, oh, and uh, sorry, I mean, this is because the slides are still from Marcus, and here we have some images. This should be A2 and A1, these W's. Huh? And uh, I mean, changing it in all the images would, be, would have been too much work for me, sorry for that. Huh? So you, you have to change these W's into A's. Yeah. And yeah, so what we, what we have here is in this middle uh, graph, we see the prior distribution of our parameter vector A. Yeah? And remember, um, or not remember here, um, what, what we did here is we selected alpha equal 0.5, which is the um, is it, yeah, it's the standard deviation of our parameter vector, and so we get such a isotropic Gaussian, Gaussian, which means we have circular contour lines. So that's the parameter prior. Huh? Okay, and now we take data coming from this straight line. So we are fitting now the parameters for a straight line, but the data points, they come from this line. So actually the goal is to determine these two parameters. Huh? Um, 0.5x minus 0.3, and that's in the parameter space, it's this point. Huh? And um, yeah, actually here we should have the straight line, yeah. So the, uh, this is, what was the function? 0.5x minus 0.3. This is, yeah, it's a green function. It's a green function. Okay, yeah. And now, here we have two graphs. The left one is the likelihood function. And this is the posterior distribution for the parameters. Yeah? Um, and what we, what we do here is we take one data point. We take one data point, which is this point. If we take this point and we use this prior distribution for the parameter, 
then we get this uh, likelihood function and this posterior. I mean, look, the posterior distribution is the product of the prior, which we have here, and the likelihood function. So if you multiply this with this, then you get this after observing one data point. And then the point is we can actually see this method as an iterative method. Now we take this as the new prior and add a second data point. So this is the picture from before. Huh? Now we take this as the prior, take this second data point, calculate the likelihood function, take the product of these two and that's what we get. And we can repeat this game by adding more and more points. Now we have three points and you see the posterior distribution um, gets a smaller um, uh, standard deviation. Yeah, and the more points we add, uh, the, the higher is our confidence about our parameter uh, vector. Yeah, okay. So, the, I mean, this is now with, I don't know, maybe 20 points and it looks quite good. And uh, also you see, I mean, here you see the difference between our uh, estimated uh, straight line and the original. <coughs> yeah. Okay, yeah, and maybe... Um, yeah, let's look at these, at these uh, graphs here because now you see for this other example where we have the, the sine function as our, uh, where the data points are generated from and now here on the left you see the maximum likelihood solution and on the right you see the Bayesian solution. Yeah? Um, I mean here initially there is no difference between these functions but what you see is the, uh, the confidence here is much lower in the result than it is here. I mean this is the standard deviation we get from the maximum likelihood solution and this is it from the Bayesian solution and what's very nice is that look here between the points so where we have the point we are quite confident. I mean, the deviation here is uh, it's more or less about uh, it, uh, no, it, it depends on the prior that we input on our parameter vector. But it is much smaller than it is between the points. Here in between the points we, we do have very high uncertainty. And now as we add more points uh, so we get this here and now we get this and look I mean this is much nicer uh, because we don't have overfitting like it is in maximum likelihood um, and also here uh, we do have a much better result and also you see I mean this is our uh, standard deviation so it, it tells us that here we don't know very much and that's actually true yeah. and the more points we get the better is our result and this is finally with something like 20 points so what we get is not too far from our sine function so it's much better than maximum likelihood yeah, okay, and that's enough for today. Thank you.